thank you, Marek, for this nice introduction, and thank you all for having me tonight. It's uh, my pleasure to come to Prague after, after some time and find this nice community of people interested in deep learning. Uh, I will be talking tonight about deep learning in a very specific context, which is medical imaging. So in the beginning, I will try to give you some introduction into what do we do in medicine, how, wh what is the set of problems we're dealing with. In the second half, we will actually focus a bit more on the deep learning. Uh, I'm coming tonight from charming town of Munich. If you're a little bit of clueless about Munich, just as I have been before I moved there, Munich is the capital of Bavaria, located some four hours southwest of Prague. It is famous for BMW, FC Bayern, the Oktoberfest, very tasty and delicious white sausage-based cuisine. But what is important for us, it's the location of Klinikum Rex de Isa, where is the lab in which I'm working currently. <coughs> in our lab, we're working on a project that is focusing on one nasty thing, and that's the back pain. You might think that back pain is not such a big problem, that it would need a dedicated research team. But in fact, the back pain is the number one reason for the work disability worldwide. And it's reason for around 40% of all missed working days in the United States. The sad part is that most of us is going to suffer from back pain sooner or later. Me, you, most of the people who actually have a sitting job in front of a computer, which is not so healthy for, for the back. Um, back pain is a, is a symptom of many different medical conditions and it is not always possible to tell what is causing the back pain. So we take a reverse approach. We figured out one reason or one medical condition which is always causing back pain and that is osteoporotic fractures. I know probably all of you know what osteoporotic fractures are, but I'm going to repeat anyway. So osteoporosis is the medical condition when the bones start losing their mineral density and they become more fragile and more susceptible to fractures. This especially happens to older people, especially older women after, after the menopause. And since we are focused on the back, the typical fracture that happens related to back pain is the vertebra compression fracture. When the, when the weakened bone isn't able anymore to, to carry the load of the body and just starts compressing. This is obviously very painful. What can be done with osteoporosis? So if it's, if it's captured in time, we can, we can do some lifestyle adjustment so that people can um, do more exercise, do less smoking. There are even some drugs that help again osteoporosis. Also, when fractures happen, we can do something, but it usually involves surgical operation. I have two examples here, just to give you idea how are we fixing this. So one example is kephoplasty, when the shape of the vertebra is restored using pressurized air and the free space is filled with some cement. Another option is spondylolisthesis, when multiple vertebra get connected to each other using some screws and rods. As you can imagine, when it goes this far, it's bad. So that is why we need to focus on prevention of osteoporosis. The typical procedure for osteoporosis prevention is so-called DEXA screening. It means dual uh, energy x-ray absorptiometry. So you take an x-ray image of some specific part of the body, for example, the hip, then you take the, oh, <laughs> nice, uh, then, then you take uh, the area of the bone and, and do some kind of limited precision estimation, what's the bone mineral density. But the big clinical question is, can we 
detect this before it happens? Can we estimate the risk of, of uh, osteoporotic fractures using automatized opportunistic screening? Unless uh, it may happen that you're not very familiar what uh, automatized opportunistic screening means, and I will get to that point later, so stay tuned. Um, the title of my presentation is Deep Learning and Medical Imaging. I already told you that I'm going to talk about deep learning in the second half, so ha let's have a look at medical imaging. The short and fancy term for that is radiology, and it's the field of medicine that uh, is dealing with obtaining medical pictures. What does it mean? There are many different ways how you can how you can get a medical medically relevant pictures. We call them image modalities. So the oldest one is the planar radiography. I guess every one of you has taken an X-ray image in the course of your life. So this is the first X-ray image ever taken. This is the hand of Mrs. Röntgen from 1895. And the black thing is not a tumor, it's a ring. Obviously, the X-ray uh, planar radiography has progressed in its quality ever since. So here you can see what is a typical X-ray image of, of, the thora, uh, of the torso of a patient. It's nice. You can see inside a patient without a need of cutting him open. That's brilliant. The problem is if you're interested in some details, let's say the spine, you can't really see it because it's kind of hidden after all the behind all the other anatomy, like the ribs and other stuff. So that's why people developed a cool thing called CT, that stands for computed tomography. And it works on the same principle as the x-rays, but instead of taking single image, you are taking mo images from multiple angle. So the patient lies on, on this moving table that goes inside this round thing we call gantry. And then um, you take images from many different angles and kind of reconstruct what is inside because you have information from many different angles, you can do it. And you obtain a volume, so 3D volume of data, where you can see every slice separately. So out of sudden you get like really precise idea what is going on inside. So this is the type of data we are working with. It has the obvious drawback then the patient needs to go lots of radiation exposure. So this is not always perfect. There are other modalities, including the magnetic resonance. It looks very similar to CT. It has the difference that it doesn't involve the dangerous radiation. Another example would be ultrasound. I suppose every one of you has had a picture of himself taken in this position, maybe. But ultrasound is much more powerful than that. It can uh, do also functional imaging, that means you don't only see how things look inside, but you also get information how they work. So for example, this is an ultrasound picture of a heart and you can see color-coded uh, blood motion. So ultrasound is very powerful and now becomes also very portable. This is one of the latest ultrasound devices. So we're gonna hear about ultrasound a lot in the future not from me in this talk, because we focus on something else, but just to give you an idea what is possible. <clears throat> so to wrap up radiology, it is the field that provides anatomical and functional images and supports doctors at all stages of decision making. From screening, that means you don't suspect that the patient has some disease, but he is in a risky group, so you kind of inspect him anyway just to detect whether he is the risky patient or not. Then diagnosis, that is, you have suspicion that this patient has a disease, but you need to make sure. Preoperative planning, that means you know that the patient has the disease and you need to operate the patient. So before the surgery, you need to do some planning, so that's preoperative planning. And also intraoperative navigation, that means the patient is already lying on the table. You have your tools inside the patient, but you don't see them and you need to see where they are. For example, if you're, if you're doing some minimal invasive operation using catheter or something like that. So radiology supports all these stages. As you can imagine, such images have 
vast amounts of information. The problem is there is not enough doctors to extract this information. So this is where we come into play. to solve it with algorithms, right? In six months, I'm gonna tell you it's not so easy. <clears throat> so let's have a look at our typical clinical scenario that we're dealing with. A patient, this poor old lady, comes to hospital with some problems. The doctor diagnoses her, says, okay, this is bad, we need to, we need to operate you, right? So she gets a CT scan like this, she goes to surgery, everything's good, lady goes home, what remains is this scan. We have the data about the patient, so what we could do is opportunistic screening. That means we don't really suspect that the lady has osteoporosis, but let's have a look anyway. So how, how would we process such image? First of all, we need to perform an segmentation of the relevant anatomy, in the spine in our case. Then we could do some texture analysis, and then we could make some mechanical simulations with this information, and see, okay, this lady is safe, she, she's not in the risky group. And if we could automate this process, we could basically extract this information about any patient who comes to the hospital and get the CT without any extra work for the patient. And this is a great step in the, in the prevention. We can also use the same pipeline when we know that this patient already has an osteoporotic fracture and needs some surgery. So we do some diagnostic image of the patient and maybe can plan the right intervention because what can happen, for example, if the bone mineral density is too low, then, for example, using the screws is not a good idea because they can't hold inside the vertebra and we need to use something else. Good. So for those of you who are not so familiar with Computer vision, I'm gonna uh, repeat what image segmentation is. That's a computer vision problem when we need to assign a label to every single voxel of the volume. So from the input image, we want to extract something like this where the dark area means background and the yellow area means this is spine. Actually, what we would really want to do is do instant segmentation. That means we not only distinguish between types of objects, but also instances. So we say, okay, this, this blue thing here is, I don't know, vertebra L2, and this pink one is maybe vertebra L5, something like that. Mm. So how this is typically done are shape models. That means you take scans of lots of people and build some mean model, how average person's spine look like. And then when you get a new image and need to segment it, you try to fit this model into the image as, as well as possible. You have some set of transformations, how you can wrap this model and maybe perturb it a little bit. It's a, it's a multi-step pipeline that has the benefit that whatever comes out of this pipeline will always look like a spine. It's brilliant. It will not always look like the spine you want to segment, so that's a bit problematic. Here you can see, for example, here's a part of the vertebra kind of missing, but this model doesn't really care. Or, or here you can see that the vertebra are kind of like overflowing one into another. So as you can see, it can be done better. This was awesome in 2009, it is not awesome in 2018. Actually, it wasn't awesome even the last year, but still. Here we are finally getting to the part what, why you came and that's the deep learning. I'm gonna do very ambitious thing here and try to explain deep learning in five minutes even for people who never heard deep learning before. No, that's not the image I wanted. No, something else. Okay. Imagine you have a picture, just like this, and you want to know what is in the picture. So what you have is a set of so-called convolutional filters that look something like this. And you apply these filters on the image, can we zoom? Good. Like this. In the moving fashion, that means we're moving the filter to every, every possible location in the image. Imagine the blue thing here 
That's the, that's the image, the moving shadow, that's our filter, and the green thing is the response to the filter, which we will call feature map. So using this filter, we can extract a feature map. This feature map is brighter in the locations where the image looks exactly like the filter, and is darker in the locations where it looks nothing like the filter. So it gives us some information, for example, edges with this angle are present in the areas where it's bright. And obviously you saw that we have many different filters, so we get many different feature maps. And we can do this again on these feature maps, extracting new features, which are not working with the individual pixels, but are working with the information we already extracted at the previous stage. So out of sudden, like some cool textures and parts of objects start emerging in these like mid-level features and we are still combining them into, into more and more abstract information about the image. So then we, we start getting things like heads and, I don't know, larger textures. Something that actually contains some useful information about the image. As you can imagine, to, to know whether there is an edge or whether there is a, some color, we only need a small portion of the image, but if we want to know if there's a head of a person or if there's a whole car, we need to have information about a large portion of the image. And that is the reason why we are slowly decreasing the resolution in the sense that every point on our feature map is representing larger and larger area, area on the original image. So if you imagine here is the, the input image with three channels, this is the red, green and blue color. Here we have more channels, each of the channels is representing some feature map. And you can see that the resolution is decreasing, that means the boxes are getting kind of thinner and longer, that means we have more features, more feature maps, which have lower resolution and it can go all the way to the point when the features have resolution one by one, that means this one feature map point is representing something about the whole image. And it can represent things like what is in the image. So is there a car? Is there a truck? Is there a bicycle maybe? So this is great, but how, how does it relate to learning? What, what is it that we are learning here? Because so far this just happens. The learning part is we don't know what these filters look like in the beginning. So what we do is we start just with some random filters. We just really say, okay, whatever numbers, whatever filters, we don't care. What we do have is lots of training data. That means images for which we are sure what is in the image. So we, we take this car picture and we pass it through the network and it says something. It probably is going to be rubbish because it's random filters, right? How could they know it's a car? They're going to say it's a bicycle. And then we use a cool thing that's called error-back propagation, but in fact it's only derivation. And uh, yeah, using this method we are able to tell each filter how much it participated on producing the wrong prediction. And we can adjust it slightly, so the next time the network sees the same image, it's more likely to say, oh, I've saw this, seen this, this is a car, right? And we are doing this for a long time with lots of images, this, this is crucial, we need lots of those images. And in the end we're going to get a network with filters that can say, okay, this is a car. So the cool part is we don't have any predefined filters that should work on any data, but we learn filters that extract relevant features for, for your specific data set. So for example, it doesn't make sense to have features that contain, I don't know, car wheel when we're dealing with patient data, right? Why would we detect car wheels in that? So that was, that was deep learning. How can we use it to segmentation? Something called fully convolutional networks that has been around for, for a few years already and is getting better and better. So as I showed you, the typical convolutional network starts from the image and extracts some kind of low resolution, high level information telling what is in the image, but we don't want to pixel, uh, we don't want to label for what is in the image, we want to label what is in every single pixel of this image. So we need second half, where we actually restore the original resolution, combining the, the high level information, what is in the image, uh, using some skip connections to get the fine details, and in the end, 
this is a this is a dog in the picture, and here there is a segmentation of the dog. This purple thing is these pixels represent the dog. So this is what we're gonna use for segmentation. There, it's not a rocket science, right? But there are some general challenges which are specific to medical field. First of all, as I said, you need lots of training data. And this is a little bit problematic in the medical field. First of all, already the scanners, the CT scanners, the incredibly expensive equipment. It's not like you can take patients, uh, patient scans using your mobile phone or anything like with general computer vision. You need to put the patient in a scanner which costs, I don't know, let's say a million euros, rough guess. Uh, the problem is such scanners also involve dangerous radiation, so you can't just take patients, put them there just for the sake of getting the data. Also sharing the data between hospitals is a little bit complicated, even anonymized. Nobody wants to give you their patient data, so you cannot build a million patient data set as, as the image net or something like that. And uh, the biggest problem is labeling of medical data is time consuming and you need actually a doctor to do that. So let's say we want to get the label segmentation images, I mean you need the label for every single pixel. To label one whole body scan takes let's say between four and eight hours. So if we want a thousand scans like that, that's roughly three years of a doctor sitting in front of a computer and clicking, clicking, clicking on every single pixel. So that's insane. Nobody's gonna do that because nobody can pay the doctor for three years to do that and the doctor's gonna kill you after three days because it's, yeah, it's punishment. The second problem is lack of interpretability. <clears throat> uh, yeah, I'm going to step back to give you an idea what is a big me medical data set. There is a challenge on spine segmentation which contains 10 volumes for training and 10 volumes for testing. Can you imagine deep learning on 10 volumes? It's ridiculous, right? Uh, second problem is lack of interpretability. Deep learning is really good at giving good predictions, pretty reliable. But it doesn't tell you why did it make such <clears throat> predictions. So imagine you have great deep learning medical system that can tell you, okay, this patient has 95 persons chance of surviving if you put him on chemotherapy now because he's got a cancer. But no doctor is going to take decision based on this. He wants to know why do you think the patient has cancer? Why do you think this therapy will save him? So, and this, these are the answers which deep learning is not able to provide. It just outputs numbers, but it's kind of black box, and this is very incompatible with the medical field. There are also some challenges specific to our spine segmentation problem. So first of all, as I said, we're working on opportunistic scans. That means these scans were not taken for the special purpose of analyzing the spine. They were taken for some completely different reason and they have different fields of view, that means you can have a spine like uh, the scan like this where you can't really see the ribs or anything else, or you can have scan like this where you only see, I don't know, five, six vertebra. <clears throat> so the method cannot really rely on any anatomical landmarks to be in the data. The data are quite heterogeneous, they come from different scanners, they have different resolutions. It's possible that there was some contrast agent applied, so even the way things look in the image can be slightly different. <clears throat> so we also need to be robust on that. And the biggest engineering problem is the data are three-dimensional. So it is nice we have all these fancy convolutional networks that work like charm on 2D images, but once you have 3D everything goes really insane. I give an example, such a scan can take 200 megabytes in the memory. It's not so much, but yeah. <clears throat> 200 megabytes in memory, which is not so much. But as I already said, you have, let's say, 60 filters, and you, after one pass through one layer of the convolutional net, you get 60 feature maps. Each of them is roughly the same size as the image. So out of sudden, from 200 megabytes, you have 12, 12 gigabytes. And this is something you cannot fit into GPU. And even if you could, that would be one layer network and it doesn't give you anything. So this is challenging, but luckily the solution are patches. 
um, <clears throat> instead of trying to take the whole thing and just make it go through the network, we decided to extract smaller patches, which are symbolized here. We can ex extract them in a very randomized fashion. So this is a nice way to do data augmentation because we can sample theoretically unlimited number of, of different patches, just taking, I don't know, slightly different rotations, slightly different something. And this has relatively low memory requirements. When I'm saying low, I'm meaning not insanely high, but still the memory is the hard limit on, on the size of your network and the number of filters you can use. It also has drawbacks. First of all, you're losing the spatial context, but maybe this is, this is a good thing because, as I said, you cannot really rely on any anatomical landmarks. So maybe it's better to have a model which is not trained to rely on the spatial context. And also it increases the runtime a bit because every patch you need to interpolate, but it's not so bad. Then during the testing time, we just sample the patches uniformly and reconstruct everything by merging the predictions. This works really nice. Um, I'll be right back with you. <coughs> We decided to do one more tweak, and that's using some sort of flat patches. <clears throat> because I think, as you can notice, the spine is quite clearly visible when we're looking at it, let's say, from side. That's called the sagittal view. So you could think, OK, so if the spine is visible well from the side, why don't we just you know, take this to extreme and then just do 2D slice after slice? I mean, it's very easy to predict the spine here in the central slice, where everything is, yeah, nice boxes, good. But it's really difficult on the sides, where even the trained doctor who's been doing this for 20 years really needs to scroll back and forth, see the neighboring slices, to be able to tell, OK, this pixel is spine or not. So this is quite good test if you're, if you're designing any machine learning algorithm just to see would a trained person be able to do this with this kind of information? If the answer is no, then the chances are also your machine learning algorithm would be, won't be able to do that. <clears throat> so our flat patches have increased resolution in the sagittal view. Let's say we have some memory budget that we can use, so it's better to use it in this way than, than doing, let's say, uh, these isotropic cubes. So overall, our network is looking something like this. You can see that here is the resolution downscaling. So here we have really small feature maps, but maybe with some high level information. Then there's the upscaling again. Here are the shortcut connections that help us restoring the small details about the segmentation. We're using some combination of 2D and 3D convolutions. Yeah, it's a slightly based on 3D unit, which is quite famous architecture for 3D segmentation. It works really nice as far as the vertebra are concerned, but it suffers from this stray segmentation problem. That means there is lots of predictions which are false positives, such as here the ribs or here parts of the intestine. Uh, so what we did, we employed some sort of attention mechanism that is a second convolutional network, which does not provide us with the fine uh, segmentation details, but instead gives very rough prediction about what is the probability that there is some spine in this region. Uh, since it's just 2D and uh, very small, it doesn't need to do any rocket science, it's quite fast. So what we do with this, we just use some Gaussian blur on this prediction, turn it into binary mask and use this to filter out the stray segmentations. It's simple as that, but works better than other fancier approaches which we tried, like um, instead of doing thresholding and, for example, having an extra layer of the network that would take prediction from both of this and kind of fuse it. Uh, so overall, it looks like this. <clears throat> we take the volume, extract the patches, do the segmentation on the patches. We have some false positives. 
take this, get this heat map, let's say, uh, apply the mask, here's our final segmentation. <coughs> it works quite nice, the dice score, that means intersection over union, that's the, uh, one of the typical measures we use for uh, comparing segmentation results. Uh, is between 85 and 88 percent. This is actually, <laughs> on our data set, it's not better than the old method. But if you look at these, let's say the red one is our prediction, the blue one is the shape model I was talking before, you can see that when it comes to following the details, then there's like big difference. I think I can zoom in. So you can see really that our method is nicely following the contours of the of the vertebra. Here the blue predictions are just, yeah, it looks like a spine, but it doesn't look like the spine in the image. Uh, on the other hand, our method suffering from problems like this, where you can see that one vertebra is completely missing. So <laughs> this is not so good. This is actually the reason why the numbers are relatively low. So to wrap this thing up, the end-to-end -end segmentation deep learning on, on this data set can really nicely handle the contours and the fractures more pre precisely, but doesn't give you any guarantee that the solution is going to be something that is anatomically viable, and this is not so good. Now I'm going to talk on a, on a second thing we did, second step, and that's a step towards the instant segmentation. So we learned that doing end-to-end -end from image to pixels probably is not going to work. So we decided to take what's good on the segmentation, and that means if you already know that there should be something there, the segmentation works perfectly. So if we had, let's say, bounding boxes around each of the vertebra, then we could just run the segmentation within the bounding box and the output would be perfect. So let's focus on the first part, how we can detect and localize these, these vertebra in the image. So roughly we want to do something like this. First extract a square or a box around every vertebra and then just run the segmentation on each of them that's, let's say, solved, checked. Deep learning also has answer to this problem. There are many 2D object detectors ranging from fast, faster, fastest RCNN, and also funny names like YOLO and SSD. I'm going to talk about SSD a little bit more in depth, and then I'm going to show you our results from the faster RCNN on this. Mm. Maybe you'll notice that these detectors work on 2D, but as I said, our data are three-dimensional. Uh, the thing is, <clears throat> on one hand, the 3D is very important when we want to do the fine voxel-by-voxel -voxel segmentation, but it's not so important when we want to predict bounding boxes, so let's just get rid of it and uh, do some sort of 2D aggregation from every volume. The simplest thing to do is to get a mean mean aggregation, that means just like sum up all the slices and create one. Mm, this is basically what you would see if you, if you took an x-ray of the patient, if you remember what I was showing in the beginning. Problem is, you can't really see the spine. <laughs> you know it's there, but you don't see it. Uh, so the thing is, here you can see that the spine is only on the center. So maybe it would make sense to do some kind of weighted average, taking just the slices which are here. Mm, the reason why we do not do some kind of uh, uniform distribution is the, the spine is not always so nice and, and straight. There are people with like very crooked spine where it looks like an S or something. And uh, also it's not guaranteed that the spine is going to be really in the center, so that's why we use some kind of Gaussian. And you can see that already this result look quite decent. You can see the individual vertebra there, this should, this should work. The problem is we had, I don't know, I'm going to say 100 patient volumes. 
And 3D is lots of information. So if we just aggregated all the 3D into 2D images, we would lose immense amount of data and probably made the problem not really solvable. So we can still do some sort of data augmentation and use some kind of noisy weighting. That means from one volume we can get lots of different 2D uh, aggregations. So this is, this is a good way how we can get more data. Mm -hmm. So now let's get to, to the SSD, which stands for Single Shot Multibox Detector. Here you can see something which is typical convolutional network that I was showing before. You you have some input image, then you do some convolution. Here you can see here are the feature maps, feature maps, the smallest feature maps. How do they look like? So this feature map might be four by four and it might look like this. There are, let's say, four of them to make it simple. <coughs> the brighter the point on the, on the feature map, the, the stronger is the is something that this feature map is representing. It's not always clear what it is. The, the more it is present in this location in the image. So as I said, as the resolution gets smaller, each of the points on the feature map is representing a larger part of the image. So we know there is something present in this location of the image, right? Maybe we could use this information to predict whether there are some relevant objects. So we kind of plug in this detector and classifier on this on this set of feature maps. And let's say we define some so-called anchor bounding boxes <coughs> at each of the positions. And for each of the bounding boxes, let's say this one, we want to predict uh, two things. First of all, what is the chance that there is something in this bounding box? And the second thing, if there is something, how much I need to shift this anchor box to make it, to make it perfectly fitting the object I'm detecting? Um, mm -hmm. And obviously we can do this also on different levels of the feature maps. This is naturally giving us a different, different resolution of the bounding boxes we are predicting. So this works quite nice, but as you can imagine, the same object is going to get detected multiple times by these different kind of anchor boxes, because you can see there are many overlaps. So we apply something called non-maximum suppression, where for a bunch of overlaid bounding boxes, you only take the one with the highest confidence. So as I said, we are predicting what is the offset and what is the confidence. So we only keep the one with the highest confidence and discard the others. Let's see some results we had. This is a receiver operating characteristic curve. And basically it means the more the curve is following this edge of the chart, the better. We weren't, uh, in this case, predicting two classes, that means spine, non-spine, but we were also trying to predict which part of the spine it is, so cervical, thoracic, or lumbar. You can see that for lumbar, this is, this is nearly perfect, this is great. For thoracic, good enough, for cervical it sucks, but the reason is simple, the cervical region of the, of the spine is severely underrepresented in our data set, so it's obvious it can be so good. And the second thing is we don't care so much because that's not the part where the osteoporotic fractures are happening anyway, so well enough. So from the quantitative point of view, well done, but let's see some qualitative results. I hope you can, you can see it. This one is pretty much perfect. The, the network managed to predict all of the vertebra, except for this tiny one, which I would miss myself. So, well done, network. <coughs> there were some worse results, such as this, where you can see this one got missed. Two false positives. So overall, this is already three mistakes in our scenario, not very acceptable. You can already see that there is a problem. The bounding boxes have 
extremely high overlaps. <clears throat> and as I was talking about the non-maximum suppression, there is some parameter called threshold. It means um, how big overlap the bounding boxes can have unless we start considering like predicting the same object. And this method is extremely sensitive to how you set this parameter. And it is very hard to set the parameter in a way that it yeah, doesn't have missing prediction, doesn't have false positives, each of those. And then there were actually like really bad predictions like this, where the number of error is 9 out of 19 bounding boxes. So this is not really usable in our case. So to sum this up, these basic object detectors have great performance. I was really nicely surprised how well this works despite limited amount of data and <clears throat> let's say quite high difficulty of the problem, but depend quite heavily on the hyperparameters and we are still where we were before. This does not really guarantee anatomically viable solutions. So our current direction of, of interest is instead of um, trying to predict some random number of objects is regression uh, of the location of predefined number of objects. That means like having one dedicated predictor for every vertebra. But yeah, this is future directions. So thank you for your attention and now is the discussion time. Are there any questions here? Yeah, thanks for a very interesting talk. You mentioned one of the problems was that using the convnets in the first part didn't guarantee anatomically viable solutions. Is there any reason why not to use the shape model to sort of build uh, in place of the attention network? So it would identify the patches for you where you can then use your deconv model to do the fine tuning? Thanks. Uh, that's a brilliant idea and that is what we are exactly using right now as a replacement solution. The problem is the shape models are also not really perfect in the sense that they often make a mistake by shifting the whole thing one vertebra up or down or sometimes they just fail completely to, to match it so it also has its drawbacks but it's a very good idea. Okay. Is it possible, do you know, to estimate the bone mineral density from images like this? And do you do it with deep learning at all? Has anybody tried it? <clears throat> yeah, using deep learning for estimating that would be, <clears throat> let's say, overkill because you can, uh, there's a closed form solution between the intensities in the scan and the bone mineral density. Right. So this is easy to extract. Okay, next question, questions. Okay, uh, I have one. Uh, do you have any idea why you are losing the the like those pieces? Is it because of this attention doesn't catch this area, or is it like the other phase? It's a bit of a both. First of all, the attention at I have to say this was a bit of a emergency solution because the deadline was coming and the results were not. <clears throat> so there wasn't also so much time to. Spend pent on it and yeah uh, so it was also kind of cutting off something and yeah the other thing is also our training data were not always perfect in the sense that sometimes the doctor just would not label the last vertebra or especially the first around the around the neck I think I can give some image here So you, you can see also the first one is missing, or at least one half of it is missing. That is quite ridiculous. So especially in these edge areas around the edge of the image, this was this was quite a common problem. But I think it was a bit caused by the inconsistencies in the data set. Okay. Yeah.
situation and came uh, another doctor, doctor and uh, he said, no, this isn't uh, right, the uh, adaptation is uh, another bar. Okay, so the question was, how many doctors did the annotations? Um, the thing is, annotation did only one person because it's so time consuming, you can't really have anyone going after the doctor checking it. But <clears throat> yeah, in fact, it wasn't done uh, in the sense that the doctors would start from scratch. Actually, the annotations were initialized by the shape models and then the doctors were only correcting them. So this is also a little bit of a bias towards the good score for the second method because the ground through was based on the second method so if the doctor saw okay this looks more or less fine then I'm not gonna do anything with that so this creates clear bias and yeah the second thing is it's not really the trained doctor doing this it's always medical student <laughs> doctoral candidate my like working title is Mr. Slave, <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> I'm I'm glad to be doctoral student in in IT and not in medicine. Okay, more questions. Uh, like uh, so far, it seemed like you are predicting where the spine is, and trying to actually identify all the vertebras. Uh, but the goal is to see whether there is a damage in the vertebra, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I, I'm not sure I have really seen this and the decision, this is a damage or not. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's uh, a good, good point. Uh, So, as I was saying, this requires a complex pipeline and the anatomy segmentation is just the first step that is necessary for the other things. So, we have also other team working on extracting the texture features and doing the mechanical simulations. But, yeah, this project is still running, so we don't have this pipeline finished yet. Okay, uh, one more question for me. Uh, so, what's the actual reality? How many screen, like labeled screenings or like mm -hmm. those models did you have? Mm, we are quite lucky because we are in the hospital. So, we have direct communication with the doctors and the doctors have direct access to medical students who can do the labeling. So, our data set is relatively large. That means we have around 100 scans our own, then uh, we are also collecting some publicly available data set that makes for another 30 scans maybe. And uh, yeah, obviously since we want to do uh, fracture prediction, we also need to have the same patient scanned at different times. So currently there is a, there is a data set of around 2000 scans where the patients have been scanned in the in the span of five years, so it's not sure. Uh, I'm, I mean, it's not clear in how many of those actually some fractures happen. So how many of those we will be able to use, for example, for the risk prediction in the future? And also, these two thousand are not fully annotated yet. But once we have this kind of high quality running segmentation, we can let's say segment them automatically, and then just use the information for the following steps of the pipeline. How much did you use the data augmentation for boosting your data set? Let's say how many data samples you have after you augment the data set? Uh, so what we do usually is doing the augmentation online. That means we just set some distribution of augmentation parameters and sampling the, the patches on the go. So there's not really a, a number. Thank you. Do we have some more questions? Okay, if not, uh, thank you once again. <laughs>